hello everybody um as you can see in my title there it's a querying state sanctioned suicide prevention promotion um i just want to draw your attention to those two images on the screen for, for the people in the recording or people who may be without sight we have two images taken from um the tory conference i think it was in 2017 um and lots of uh, disabled rights movements went to protest and if we see on the image on on the left here um this officer is not assisting this gentleman this officer and her many 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 colleagues are actually moving this gentleman on because this gentleman who is clearly profoundly disabled in a wheelchair um, a disabled person is blocking the trams um, causing a big big stink up and it's quite good and on the right hand side once again lots of police officers therefore to stop people with people in wheelchairs who are in fact dead and the sign they're holding is declared fit for work there's two of them, and there's two people there. There's this lovely face here is of Ian Duncan Smith, <clears throat> and this is David Cameron, the PM at the time, um, who is very controversial. Okay, I just wanted you to flag those images up. Okay. Thank you for coming today. I would like to extend my thanks to Professor B and the whole Insights team, Patrick, for allowing me to present today. As you may be aware, I'm not in the front, which is generally normal. This is due to several of my own impairments, disabilities, and I thank you for your support in this matter. So thank you very much. <coughs> the title of this presentation is deliberately obscure, but I just wanted to cover something just in case anybody is unsure of its meaning. I've used in the title the term query, which for the uninitiated may seem strange and or controversial. The verb to queer from where we get the practice of querying is to analyse, engage, interrogate or assess any subject through and in conversation with queer theory. Queer theory needs a lecture in and of itself. As such, there is an excellent one done by Professor B on the Insights YouTube channel. But for brevity, I will just speak about how I use it in my research. <coughs> Queer theory is an intersectional and multidimensional discourse that seeks to identify and expose loci of heteronormativities. It is inspired by, and will always have roots in, the experiences, voices, voices and continuing uh, oppression of LGBTIQ communities around the globe. However, Queer theory does not require its focus to be primarily on LGBTIQ issues. Queer theory, in an academic sense, utilises through coding analysis of power dynamics and structural hegemonies with feminist understandings and expressions. These postmodern, post-structuralist engagements allow for methods and methodologies of research and study that requires a constant awareness of the role of normativity, heteronormativity. In the constant dialogue of queer theory, many theorists and activists will highlight and expose what is called heteronormativity. Heteronormativity builds upon feminist expositions that reveal the value of the patriarch in social structures. Heteronormativity therefore furthers the exposition by highlighting the further value of a heterosexual patriarch, the idea of the straight man as a villain that has caused so much pain and oppression. When, Q, when QT or Q theory, queer, queer theory encounters critical race theory or post-colonial theory, the straight man becomes the straight white European man and so on and this keeps developing and developing as queer theory encounters things until eventually you get to a point where the villain isn't there anymore the villain is the structure and society that we live in therefore the development of queer theory allows for the identification of normativity as the value judgment of a particular expression experience of humanity such judgments lead to disenfranchisement exclusion and ultimately oppression Okay, okay, I'm going to some model terminology and definitions of disability now. The moral and spiritual model. Disability is a result of a transgression of a moral code. Perhaps it is a sin or a test of faith, possibly as a rarefication of evil, such as possession. Faith and or belief is a central part of, this, of the disability and also an attempt at a cure. This model is arguably the most widespread in the world today. And we can think of people like Benny Hinn in the evangelical mu movement in America who heals people just by touch, which is always interesting. The medical model of disability. 
Disability impairment ill health is something to be cured or fixed or ameliorated within the individual. Sometimes called the tragedy model or even the professional model, disability is understood as a wholly negative attribute of an individual existence. This that is to be removed, fixed or compensated by adaptations in or on the person. These are the two biggest traditional models. The social model of disability. During the 1970s, disabled activists Vic Finkelstein, Colin Barnes and Mike Oliver used a neo-Marxist Foucauldian genealogy archaeology to interrogate and adapt disability in the UK and beyond. They come up with that impairment is a functional limitation within the individual caused by physical, mental or sensory impairment. Therefore, disability is the loss of opportunities to take part in the normal life of the community on an equal level with others due to physical or social barriers. What they've done is they've separated the idea of disability from impairment. It's society that makes us disabled. This, along with many other campaigns and scholarship, led to legislation in the form of the Disability Discrimination Act, DDA. Also, an expression has been adopted in the UK and elsewhere when referring to people with impairments, which is disabled people. This expression highlights the oppression of people of placing disabled first. as a key term, disabled people. The Civil Rights Model. Also to refer to as a minority model, influenced by the civil rights movements of American Black, LGBT and women's rights campaigns, but also encompassing the return of Vietnam veterans with or without disabling injuries. Disability has led and leads to disenfranchisement, devaluing and marginalisation. It identifies areas of ableism, which is the promotion of the non-disabled as morally, socially and economically superior to people with disabilities. I think you can start to see where things such as queer theory and heteronormativity can actually start to actually help us understand things. Civil rights model uses the people first language, people with disabilities. I'm highlighting key, I'm highlighting key terms there, just because they'll be, they'll be relevant later. So the civil rights model uses people first language, people with disabilities, to recognise humanity and diversity beyond the narrow confines of labour and, consu and consumption. So this is a, the term people with disabilities originates in the US of A. Okay. The World Health Organization, which is an which is a United Nations agency, states that disability is an umbrella term covering impairments, activity limitations, and part participa participation restrictions. This is interesting, Spire. An impairment is a problem in body functional structure, and that's it for impairment. So mental, sensory has been eschewed for just body functional structure. An activity limitation is a, is a difficulty encountered by an individual in executing a task or action, while a participate participation restriction is a problem experienced by an individual in involvement in life situations. With the social model, the classic example would be a, a person who uses a wheelchair. And a person who uses a wheelchair is not disabled by the fact they have to use a wheelchair, they're disabled by the fact that the doors won't open automatically or there are no ramps. Okay, or the disabled toilet has a shower in it, or so on and so forth. Okay, with the civil rights model, this model means that the, the people are no longer valued by the, the, the government, which is different from the social model, so that, that it becomes more powerful. So, and we can see here that um, the idea of, of activity limitations and participation restrictions is similar to the, the civil rights model and the social model, but they're not the same. The United Nations Hum uh, Commission of Human Rights, Office of the High Commissioner, has a committee on the rights of persons with disabilities. There's that term again. The United Nations Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities states that persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, sensory impairments. Note the difference here in language compared to the World Health Organization, 
which in interaction with various barriers may hinder the full and effective participa participation in society on an equal basis with, with others. Note the difference there between the World Health Organization, and even this one uses more, more medicalized language, but also uses social model and civil rights model language. Okay. The Americans with Disability Act, which was enacted in 1990, defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of such an individual. So it's fundamentally medical. It's based upon the physical. There's no social aspect to disability there. There's no participation with restrictions. In the UK, the Disability Discrimination Act, later assumed to the Equality Act 2010, states that a person has a disability if P has a physical or mental impairment and the impairment has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on the person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. Now, once again, notice the language. You see, we're still very much medical, still very much based on the impairment. We're not, we're not talking much about the social. But also look here, major life activities, which is washing, drinking, eating, um, talking, uh, communicating, or things, becomes normal day-to-day -day activities. So one's major life activities, one's normal. Notice the difference in language because here, this is a civil rights concern. This is this is legislation. Here, this is just an act of parliament. So there's a ma major difference there. So that's an interesting linguistic point there for those people who like language. Okay. Ah, okay. In October of 19, uh, 2017, the United Nations Commission on the Rights of People with Disabilities published the findings from an inquiry into how UK government is treating disabled people with regard to the United Nations Convention of Rights of People with Disability. There it is. Um, that's the front page of it. And they say... Consequently, the committee considers that there is a reliable evidence that the threshold of grave or systematic violations of the rights of persons with disabilities has been crossed in the state party. The conclusion is based on the following findings. But before we look at those, that expression there, grave or systematic violations, that's what we use, or that's what United Nations use, when they talk about North Korea and the people in China and people in Rwanda. That's what they use. Okay, but they're using it about people with disabilities, about the state party, in this case is, of course, <clears throat> the Conservatives and the Coalition. And these are based on these following findings. Now, I have cherry-picked these findings, okay, for the purpose of this presentation. There is a lot more that goes into a lot more detail, but I just want to highlight these points here. In terms of the welfare system, reforms have been justified in the context of austerity. So it, it's basically a money issue, which the following happens. The impact assessments conducted by the state party prior to the implementation of several measures of its welfare reform expressly foresaw an adverse impact on persons with disabilities. They have made that very clear. The party, the government, knew what was going to happen. Okay, They knew. And then guess what happens? Several measures have disproportionately disproportionately and adversely affected the rights of people with disabilities. So it did happen. This is all lovely language here. It's all very diplomatic. So what actually happened? Okay, the assessment process. The UK has a number of disability social security programmes. The two main areas of social security are personal independ independence payments, PIP, and employment and support allowance, ESA. These are managed by, by the Department of Work and Pensions, the DW. I'll, I'll mostly be concentrating on, on ESA if I managed it. <laughs> Whilst PIP is classed as an in-work benefit, meaning it can be awarded regardless of income, ESA is classed as an out-of-work benefit, so there are restrictions on income, savings and capital. If you are not awarded ESA, you will have to apply for the main out-of-work benefits, such as job seeker allow allowance, which is now becoming universal credit, okay? That's important. To claim ESA, you must fill out the ESA 50 form. This is where disability impairment or ill health fetishization begins. Good word, that. 
Fetishization refers to a process which seeks to normalise an individual circumstance into a neat box, where the lived experience of something is disregarded in favour of an example or favour an example or description. This form is split into three sections. This is just this is the front of the form. These are just one page of it. There's plenty of pages, but the form is into three sections: physical health problems, mental health, cognitive, intellectual problems, eating and drinking. Okay, so. Now it's a language there. Physical disabilities are health problems. Hang on, are they? Psychological impairments have been reduced to just three three headings. Mental health, cognitive, intellectual problems. What about emotional well-being? You know, and so forth. And then suddenly, I know we're eating and drinking. It, it just seems a bit odd. Very, very odd. Okay, the form is sent off with as much supporting evidence as possible. Such evidence can, does, and should contain letters from specialists, letters from GPs, clinics, nurses, or anyone or any organization that can speak with authority about your condition. An individual called a decision maker then decides to either reject the claim, award the claim, or send the claim for a work capability assessment. Decision makers are civil servants who generally have had no medical or healthcare training. The DMs have been trained to apply the legislation employment and, support, uh, employment and support regulations to them as amended using a combination of that, the decision maker's guidance and a guide to the employment and support allowance and work capability assessment. So these non-medically trained people have to use this pieces of evidence, these, 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 this structure to change people's lives. Okay. The work capability assessment is carried out in person by a healthcare professional. The healthcare professional can be a GP, a nurse, a paramedic, a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, or as I found out recently, a veterinary nurse. The veterinary nurse part of it um, was told to me by my MP. Well, I gave this presentation to an MP and she, she, she added to it, which is great. And she said, you're actually a veterinary nurse. Okay, so, I mean, the thing is, a GP has no relevance to a physiotherapist. They, you know, they, I mean, a paramedic and an occupational therapist, they're both excellent professions, but they don't, they're not the same. And a veterinary nurse? Wow. Okay. The, the healthcare professionals do not work for the Department of Work and Pension. The assessment process has been awarded to two multinational private pro profit-making corporations. Atos and Maximus. Now, I say Atos and Maximus. They've changed their names, and some things have come different. But the, these are the. If you look up Atos and Maximus, you'll find these, and they're making huge profits. Huge profits about what they're doing to people. Okay, the claimant will be asked a range of questions. Then a physical examination occurs. The healthcare professional will provide a report to the DA, the decision maker, based upon the Logic Integrated Medical Assessment Software, Lima. The software further fetishizes the individual, individual as the healthcare professional should only ask the questions on the screen. Okay, they should. Now, you think that'd be good. This is what happens, okay? Then what's about, what I'm about to show you is obviously from news reports and stuff, and this actually gets heard in ESA assessments and personal independent payment assessments, and it gets worse. Okay, people have, they've been, the assessments have been laughing at mental health problems, okay? Um, they've been disputing a patient's uh, obsessive compulsive disorder because they hadn't washed. So apparently that's how you can diagnose someone who has OCD because they don't or they wash a lot. Okay. You don't look stressed. Okay. And actually this is actually important. You're actually advised if you're going to these sort of things if, to, not, to, not, to not bathe, to not shave, to not brush your hair. Because if you look like you can cope, then you can go to work. You know, very interesting. Okay, saying someone wasn't suicidal because she smiled. That was nice. That was nice. When did you catch Down syndrome? That this is from a healthcare professional. Yeah, just just for clarity, you can't catch Down syndrome. And why haven't you killed yourself yet? That last one, they asked me that. There are seventeen such descriptors. Such descriptors. I mentioned descriptors. Oh yeah. Oh, for one of the, for one of the esports and a further sixteen for the, for the for the next. Okay, okay. This is one of the descriptors that the the decision maker will use with um, the report from 
the w the, the 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 healthcare professional and all the sporting evidence okay this one here i just picked out because this one this is about people with epilepsy okay look at that that's about epilepsy you know at least once a week has involved the episode of loss or altered consciousness resulting in significant significantly disrupted awareness of concentration and you get awarded points and you if you get enough points you get awarded and blah 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 but what they use is a thing called the descriptors use a biopsychosocial model of disability that only barely resemble, resembles internationally recognised biopsychosocial models, such as the World Health Organization, that we saw earlier, their international classification of functioning disability in health, or the ICS. And for that model, for, um, for epilepsy, they have that. Um, you don't need to read it. They have that, 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 and that. So it's that's all been reduced to that, because the people who are using this are not healthcare professionals. You know, the people who use this are actually people who work in healthcare, but also also um, caring for people with disabilities and impairments. So this is what's happening. Okay, and then this happens. The DM will decide using the ESA 50 supporting evidence and the work capability assessment if the claimant can be awarded the ESA. This decision comes in three forms. Claim is closed, that's important, important, due to the person being found fit for work. So closed, fit for work, remember those? You'll be testing it anyway. Awarding the claim because the person has limited capability for work and they go, therefore going to the work-related activity group. This part here, LCW, that's important, and I'll mention that in a second. The second half bit is just relates to ESA. Or... The award and the claim because the person's limited capability for work-related activity, LCR, LCWRA, and therefore going to the support group. Imagine if you had an intellectual disability and you've got to try and understand these terms. You know, imagine if you had dyslexia and you've got to try and spell LCRWA out from WRIG, LCWSG, and it's confusing. Okay, this is the reality. In 2012, the DWP published statistics that show that between January 2011 and November 2011, less than a year, 10,600 people died within six months of their claim being closed. Okay, remember what that means? Their claim being closed, okay? But, but we can't make accurate states because they were found fit for work. However... In 2015, the UK government tried to suppress the morbidity or mortality statistics for the period from 2011 to February 2014. The C Information Commissioner's Office ruled that the Department for Work and Pensions has incorrectly applied Section 22, it's a legislation thing, so they've tried to uh, suppress it. And as you can see, uh, the figures they were trying to pr suppress show between 2011 and 2014, 50,580 people died whilst claiming ESA, which, as it's an ill health benefit, you can't, you can't say, but 2,280 people died after being found fit for work. Now, if you heard of a film called I, Daniel Blake, this actually, this is what, that, this is what inspired that film. Um, it's, it's not a fantastic film, but I, I implore anybody to go and watch it. it it's, or you can, I think it's on Amazon Prime, if, if you've got that. But it's worth a watch. It gives you a more dramatised version of what's happened. Okay. A coroner in 2013 stated, obviously, after investigating a death, that the anxiety and depression were long-term problems, but the intense anxiety that triggered his suicide was caused by his recent assessment by the Department for Work and Pension, DWP, as being found fit for work, and he's viewed the likely consequences of that. Okay, so a coroner has actually made the, the actual link between the work capability assessment and suicide. Okay, so that link's there. That I don't, I don't have to make that up. In 2016, the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health a fairly well-respected journal, published a paper reviewing the ramifications of the work capability assessment during the periods of 2010 to 2013. The re results are shocking. Well, they are to me. Okay. An additional three-quarters of a million antidepressant items were described. Of course, someone's got to pay for that coming from the NHS. So that's extra pills, extra therapy, extra practices and stuff. 
an additional 279,000 cases of mental health problems are recorded. So the work capability assessment is actually making people more disabled. You know, it's actually including more stress. It's, it's not designed for that. It's just making people worse. And this last one, there were 590 suicides. Now, in comparison, that doesn't seem that much, but that's 590 friends and colleagues and possibly mothers and fathers and siblings and, and you know, and possibly just people. And it, that's, the, you know, they're, they're, there's the state-sanctioned suicide, you know, promotion prevention because they're literally designed to 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 um, cull the herd but that's my opinion sorry uh, those numbers are for a three-year period 2010 to 2013 there are reports that the actual reality today has seen a drastic increase in the amount of suicides directly attributable to the, the wca like i said i can't present them as fact at the moment i can't show you them because there's an awful lot of work needs to go down, go on to them, but it it's gone. It's 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 bad. It's really bad at the moment, really bad. Despite ESA being classed now as a legacy benefit, the same work capability assessment with the same questions asked by the same company will be used for disabled people who claim universal credit. So going forward, people are still on ESA now, but going forward, all of that problems will go will will carry on and be ported over to universal credit. So the problem isn't fixed. Okay, how does that apply to queer theory? Well, disability, impairment, or ill health intersects with every instance on the continuum of human variation. If individuals or groups are not directly impacted now, they will be aware of people who are. Indeed, on a long enough timeline, everyone is impacted. Death, it could be said, is the ultimate impairment. Disability can also be seen as an ultimate example of the feminist assertion of the movement of the private to the public or the personal is the political. Furthermore, interrogating disability using Foucault's ideas of pastoral power dynamics reveals that the state's role as arbiter of support and caring is undermined. A queer theoretical emancipatory analysis allows for the identification of a heteronormative narrative that narrative reduces the rarefied and lived experience of disability, impairment, or health into a fetishized caricature of need. I think of the act of fetishizing as a form as a performance of hyperreality, where the representation of a reality is more important than the reality itself, which in turn leads to inaccurate support services and social security, because a point scoring exercise does not and cannot reflect reality. Okay, Queer and State Sanctions Suicide Prevention Promotion. Okay, where I might ask is the normativity. Do you remember this? The United Nations Inquiry into the Rights of the Person with Disabilities in the UK. The, uh, the government published a response, and the response was, what next? Like other United Human Rights Conventions, the CRPD does not contain any mechanism that allows the committee to enforce its recommendations. As the government's response to the report rejected all the recommendations made, there are no more official steps in the process. So after all the stuff, and I haven't, I haven't gone into details by any means, but after all the stuff that was in that report, the government says, well, they're not going to do anything, so we're not going to do anything, we're, we're ignoring it, okay? Okay, so a group of non-normative people, in this case, people with disabilities or disabled people, and the government's just gone, no, no, despite the fact people are dying, they've, they've ignored it. Okay, you may have noticed recent couple of weeks ago, there was a statement on a visit to United Kingdom by Professor Philip Olston, United Nations Special Rapporteur, and extreme on extreme poverty and human rights. I don't know if any of you read it. It's um, it's quite damning. It's not the full report yet. It does mention people with disabilities, but it also mentions other groups such as pensioners such as such as uh, uh, working poor such as one parent families and so on and so forth this was published on london in london 6 november 2018 okay does anybody think what do you think the government's gonna do hands up who thinks nothing guess what you're all wrong because normativity applies even evening subgroups so now the government is actually launched on the 15th of November, the day before, okay, an inquiry launched in the effectiveness of the welfare system. So beforehand, 
when with actual evidence of people actually dying, being forced to kill themselves, and there's hundreds of thousands of people dying in care homes, it goes on and on and on, the government will do nothing. However, when people who are not disabled get affected, who are still poor, the government jumps into action, look, there it goes, right? And the committee's new inquiry, launched as the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, makes an invest investigative visit to the UK, will consider how effectively our welfare systems work to protect against harsh and chronic deprivation. The point is, what queer theory and looking for heteronormative and normative instances shows that even in subgroups such as the poor, there is still a normative structure. Okay? People are dying, and the government will do nothing. People are hungry. Which, do not get me wrong, it's disgusting this is. I mean, the, you know, food banks are disgusting. But now the government's existing. That's what queering state sanctions, suicide prevention promotion shows us. Thank you for your patience.